the website of the Iranian state-run media company that's called Press TV. Uh, they've got a special news section just for news about the United States. So it's basically the news about America from Iran. And uh, so according to Iran, state-run media, these are the top stories in the United States right now. Number one, uh, obviously the story that has transfixed America, Congress staffer arrested on gun charge. That's the very top story. Second story, U.S. foreign aid clobbers third world. Also, uh, they've got a story about the curse of American exceptionalism, big business loves desperate workers, and then their main international story, U.S. taxes pay for Israeli war crimes. There's actually two features on that one, American and Israeli war crimes. Uh, and then their politics feature of the day is this, Hillary Clinton motto, represent banks. Uh, they've also got a business section on their American coverage, as typified by this headline, Economic Lynching in the United States. So this is Iran's state-run media. And yes, it is in the English language, but it is very much the work of the Iranian government. Uh, and, and a lot of different countries have English language state-run media. That's sometimes about us, but sometimes just their English language take on the world. And sometimes you can tell from the awkwardness of their use of English language that you're not dealing with a typical English language news source. Like this headline today at one of the official Chinese newspapers, U.S. chicken off to China again. And actually, when you read the story, I think that may grammatically be technically accurate. But U.S. chicken off is a hard way to start any sentence, no matter what comes after those three words, even if it is technically accurate. So, so sometimes you can tell because of the story selection. Uh, sometimes you can tell by the way they write their stories. But there, there's always a little bit of awkwardness, right? There's a little bit of friction in state-run media trying to look like normal news. And in March of this year, at the not quite state-run, but definitely state-sponsored TV channel that's called Russia Today, an American anchor working at that ostentatiously Putin-friendly outlet uh, decided that she had had enough uh, of Russia Today and how they wanted her to cover the news. And she ended up quitting her job at Russia Today while she was on the air, and she quit with a flourish. As a reporter on this network, I face many ethical and moral challenges, especially me personally, coming from a family whose grandparents, my grandparents came here as refugees during the Hungarian Revolution, ironically to escape the Soviet forces. Personally, I cannot be part of a network funded by the Russian government that whitewashes the actions of Putin. I'm proud to be an American and believe in disseminating the truth. And that is why, after this newscast, I'm resigning. That was in March. An American broadcaster working for Russia Today resigning on the air. Her name is Liz Wall, resigning in protest of what she called that network's whitewashed coverage of Russian President Vladimir Putin uh, and specifically of Russia invading Ukraine. So that was uh, four months ago on Russia Today. And then today, today, it happened again. Uh, although this time it happened on Twitter and not on the air. A London based journalist working for Russia Today, uh, she started earlier today tweeting things from her. Russia Today Twitter account, uh, things that definitely did not tow the Russia Today party line. Uh, she said things like, yes, we do work for Putin. We are asked on a daily basis, if not to totally ignore, then to obscure the truth. Uh, she also tweeted what she said was sort of tongue-in-cheek Russia Today style guide. Rule number one, it's always Ukraine's fault. She says it's the Russia Today's first style says, guide, right? but I'm for the truth. Uh, she later explained that the way Russia Today was covering the Malaysia Airlines disaster in eastern Ukraine, she said that was the straw that broke the camel's back for her. That's why she could no longer, in good conscience, stay working at that network. And it should be noted that the coverage that Russia Today has, has done of that plane being shot down in eastern Ukraine, it is kind of a stunner whether or not it has anything to do with camels or straw. I mean, here, for example, is the first big exclusive that Russia Today had about the plane being shot down in eastern Ukraine. Now, you can't find this story online anymore unless you go to the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine, because Russia Today has since taken it down. But this was their big scoop uh, that they posted yesterday afternoon. This was what they posted yesterday as their big 
big scoop on what really happened in eastern Ukraine. According to Russia Today's sources, see, the real target was not some innocent Malaysian airliner full of Dutch people and AIDS researchers. According to Russia Today's sources, the real victim here, the real intended target, was actually Vladimir Putin. They were trying to shoot him down. See, Russia's the victim here. Putin is the victim here. They were shooting at him. Everybody rally around President Putin, the poor victim. Russia Today posted that as their big scoop yesterday afternoon. Then later, to uproarious laughter, I think they took it down. Uh, and now they once again have started shedding embarrassed journalists from their payroll. And, and as ridiculous as this kind of stuff is from Russian state-sponsored media, you just sort of expect them to try this, right? I mean, they have every incentive, no matter how ridiculous it looks, they have every incentive to try to make Russia look slightly more sympathetic here, to try to make themselves look like the victim instead of the villain, to at least try to muddy the waters as the whole world recoils in shock at what either Russia or Russian-supported forces appear to have done. And, and vehicle-mounted surface-to-air missile systems, they, they've been around since the, the, these particular ones that exist in that part of the world, they've been around since the 1970s, so lots of different iterations of them, and they're used by both Russia and Ukraine. And these surface-to-air missiles on vehicles like these, they're not just point-and-shoot weapons. You don't just learn to use one of these things on a firing range or plinking away in the backyard the way you might with small arms. Or even something like a rocket-propelled grenade launcher, which somebody could teach you how to use in a day. Or a stinger missile you might use to shoot at a helicopter, right? These kinds of missile systems that can shoot something down from tens of thousands of feet in the air, these take more than one person to operate. They're radar-guided systems. They're complicated. We talked with an editor at Jane's Defense Weekly today who told us that this sort of weapon system that can take down an airliner at 30,000 feet? This sort of weapon system takes weeks or months of training to master. Nobody volunteered to fight with the separatists a few days ago and then started shooting missiles like this, is what he told us. So that much we know just in terms of the technology and the technological constraints here, and that's part of the factual record. And here is something else that's part of the factual record that now becomes newly relevant and newly central to what happened here. And it happened in the United States, it happened at the Pentagon two and a half weeks before this plane was shot down yesterday. And all of a sudden, it's really, really important. On June 30th, so two and a half weeks ago, an Air Force general named Philip Breedlove, who's the U.S. commander of NATO forces in Europe, he gave a relatively short press briefing at the Pentagon. He answered questions from the press. And in that press briefing, he said NATO had observed that surface-to-air missiles, anti-aircraft missile systems, not just the shoulder-fired ones, but the big vehicle-borne surface-to-air missiles that are designed to shoot down airplanes, those had been observed in eastern Ukraine and just across the border in western Russia. Okay, and this is two and a half weeks before the plane was shot down. He said it was NATO's observation that Russian forces had started training the separatists in Ukraine on how to use those complex anti-aircraft weapon systems that can shoot down planes that are 30,000 feet in the sky. What is the, um, the latest information on Russian supplies of arms to the separatists, and do they include um, anti-air weapons? To your last specific question, yes, they do include that. What we see in uh, training on the east side of the border is um, big equipment, tanks, APCs, anti-aircraft capability, uh, and now we see those capabilities being used on the west side of the border. So the aircraft that were shot down recently, you think were likely shot down with Russian-supplied weapons to the separatists? I think we need to allow the facts to be sorted out before I report it, and so I would say now it's it's a good, it's a very good likelihood. That you're seeing on the eastern side, is does that involve man pads or is that vehicle-borne? We have not seen uh, training of man pads, but we have seen vehicle-borne capability being trained. We have seen vehicle-borne capability being trained. This is sort of a, a dry Pentagon press briefing from two and a half weeks ago, and they're talking about something that wasn't getting all that much of attention at the time, but all of a sudden, what he just said there is maybe the most important thing in the whole world. Because what he said there shows, and this was two and a half weeks ago he's speaking, shows that two and a half weeks ago the commanding general of NATO had told the world at the Pentagon that NATO saw the Russians training the separatists in eastern Ukraine about how to use these vehicle-borne surface-to-air missiles that are designed to shoot down planes from a very great use that capability to take down a Ukrainian plane 
flying higher than they're supposed to be able to shoot down. That was Monday. They proved they could do it. And then on Thursday, when it happened a second time, it wasn't a Ukrainian military plane. This time it was a passenger jet that took off in Amsterdam. And you don't have to believe any froggy-voiced Ukrainian government alleged intercepts or one-and-a-half-second-long snippets of tape that could have been shot anywhere or unsourced self-serving claims by advisors to ministers in order to see that. Because what we know is all available in open-source information, and it is checkable. And it's not anonymous sources. It's all out there in the open. This is something that happened that is hard to do, that not everybody can do it. The Russians have been training the separatists on how to do it. They shot down a plane at over 20,000 feet once already this week. And the second time it happened this week, it became implausible to deny responsibility for that shoot down by saying it couldn't have been them. They don't know how. They don't have the capability. That is not conjecture. That is what we know. And given that, what do we expect Russia to do next? Because saying that Vladimir Putin is the victim here is not going to work anymore.